All right, family, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I don't want to belabor the hour too long for you all. I know that th this is your last workshop of the day. Congratulations to those who made it through the day. Give yourselves a snap, a round of applause, pat on the back. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, let's open up in prayer really quickly. Lord God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together just one more time. Lord God, you've taken us throughout this day and just given us so much information and uh, people are feeling inspired and empowered and uh, just ready to move forward. So uh, yeah, God, we just ask that you just use this as an opportunity to really build upon uh, what you've given to folks throughout the day. And for folks who uh, weren't able to join throughout the day, we just ask that this just be an opportunity for them to just feel connected, uh, not only to the uh, broader body of Christ, Lord God, but to you, Lord Jesus, individually, Lord, that they may feel connected, they may, may feel empowered, they may, may feel inspired, Lord God, that they may, Lord God, not just say, Lord God, but that they may do. And we just uh, honor you on this day, and we praise you, and we glorify you, Lord God. Let the words that come out of my mouth, Lord God, just be directly from you. Let the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you. And Lord God, we just ask you just to bless each and every person uh, as we go through breakout groups today. Just let people, Lord God, feel inspired to just share their hearts with one another. And Lord God, just uh, share your word, Lord God, as you do, uh, just divinely give that to each and every one of us. And we just honor you, and we thank you, and we praise you on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I just want to start out by saying that um, uh, if uh, this is not um, this is not necessarily a, a dialogue, it is definitely a dialogue, uh, but there's a lot of information to cover. Something that Nicole and I were talking about a little bit earlier was that uh, like throughout the day, what we realized is that there's so much amazing uh, information being disseminated and just not enough time. So my apologies in advance. Uh, that this doesn't get to be as much of an exchange, but we will have small group breakouts. So you all will get to definitely have conversations with one another, um, but uh, it's definitely kind of in two pieces. There's the information sharing, um, and then there's a kind of more small group discussion. Um, but what I will say is that if uh, PB or PS, um, if you all have anything to interject at any point, definitely feel free to flag me. I can't see the comments, uh, but Nicole has graciously agreed to um, help me out there with uh, flagging anything that may come up. Um, and then also if Pastor Jeremy or Pastor Anna are, are on um, this particular webinar as well, then definitely feel free to chime in. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to do is to actually acknowledge, um, well, I guess actually I should talk a little bit about myself maybe. Uh, so I am Jameson Watson. Uh, <laughs> thank you all for having me. I uh, currently reside in Washington, D.C., um, but I am originally from Austin, Texas by way of St. Louis or Chicago, Illinois, by way of St. Louis, Missouri, by way of Oakland, California. And now I uh, have the fortune to be in DC. Um, even though DC is my, not my favorite place, I'm still claiming it as being a victorious place where God's uh, word is gonna be just manifested and ministered here. Um, but I miss the Bay. Like there's nothing like the East Bay, y'all. Just if y'all live in Oakland or Hayward or Castro Valley, Berkeley, just never leave. I'm just telling you all right now, just. Just, just get in where you fit in and stay where the weather is beautiful, the people are amazing, and God's glory is just like going forward. Um, so with that said, um, let's see, I can't for some reason get my slides to advance, which is not what I want. Let's see here. Uh, let me pause share, then unpause it and see what happens. All right, let's try this again from the beginning. There we go. All right. So all of this is saying is that I worked at a lot of places and, and, and uh, fortunately in working at a lot of places, you get to meet a lot of amazing people and getting to meet a lot of amazing people. You run into a lot of really amazing um, and a lot of challenging perspectives. And so I'll be leaning on um, a lot in the stuff that I have to say, I'll be leaning on obviously my own experience as a, um, as a black man in the U S um, as a black man who grew up impoverished um, and a black man who, uh, had, was fortunate enough to go to college, but uh, then dropped out of college. So obviously we all have layered experiences, um, but everything that happened in my, that's happened in my life has got me to the point that I am today. So I thank and glorify God for that. Um, but, um, but yeah, we can't, we can't separate ourselves or divorce ourselves from, um, from our experiences uh, co coming up. So just keep in mind that everything that I say is definitely filtered through my experience growing up here in the United States of America, um, you know, I can't speak for other countries um, or other places that people have lived, but um, I'm only speaking for here and the things that I say. 
So um, you all have already introduced yourself a little bit. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we want to do for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, the first thing is to definitely contextualize prophecy through the experience of Daniel. Um, any uh, folks who have read the Bible um, know that there are a group of prophets that uh, are often termed the major prophets. Um, and then there are another group of prophets that are often called the minor prophets. Minor doesn't mean that they were like smaller or that their word um, wasn't directly from God. Um, it's just uh, biblically the way that uh, the, the, what we call the Old Testament or Hebrew uh, scripture was structured. Um, there were uh, prophetic, uh, there were books of prophecy that were often seen um, as being put um, at a higher status, if you will, than some of the other prof uh, prophets. So that's all we mean when we say uh, minor prophets versus major prophets. It, it has nothing to do like the word of God is, is the word of God is the word of God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's something to keep in mind. To understand how prophecy functions um, in social justice movements, uh, oftentimes we forget that um, whenever uh, the people of God uh, go out and speak, thus saith the Lord, um, and they speak out um, against social injustices, that that is actually a, a, a message that's from God spoken through the mouth of, of individuals. Because we know that like throughout uh, human history, there are very few people who are actually, who have actually had direct um, like interface contact um, with God. And so anytime that like God wants to send a message, God almost always uses a messenger. Um, to connect to God's call for a prophetic voice. Uh, so we definitely want to see how um, the calls of God are actually directed through us and how we're a mouthpiece for God. Even if we, you know, even if we don't want to be used, uh, God can, uh, as the Bible says, even use a donkey, uh, which is uh, definitely a story in the Bible, uh, which we'll allude to in a little bit. Um, and then finally, to hear God's uh, voice and be stirred to action. Um, I remember one time, uh, Pastor Benjamin Robinson, who is uh, one of the uh, who is uh, the co-pastor at Living Hope Christian Center, once, once pre preached a message called, uh, called Stir Not Shaken. Um, and uh, it was really amazing. Uh, he, what he talked about there was how, you know, the whole James Bond adage is shaken, not stirred. Um, but as Christians, we're actually called for, to be the opposite, uh, which is uh, stirred in the spirit, but not to let the world shake us. So those are the objectives that we have. I don't know why my screen keeps freezing. So maybe I'll actually just go from, let's see here. Let's pause that, then resume sharing. Okay, cool. So we'll just go through the slides on the side here because it's easier that way. All right, so I just wanna be perfectly real and perfectly honest with everyone. So um, I believe that the word of God and the manifestations and operations of the spirit still continue today so everything that happened in the Bible is actually stuff that's still happening for us today. So I know that there are people on the call who don't necessarily believe that. So I just want to be upfront, like just for disclosure, um, I am one to believe um, that the the manifestations of God and 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 that can be like things that happened in the Book of Acts, for example. You know, uh, things like uh, prophecy, things like um, the laying on of hands, things like uh, speaking in other tongues, things like um, healing of the sick, like deliverance. Like all of those things are things that God did in the Bible, and it didn't stop for whatever reason when John gave revelation, but it still continues to today. So. Um, so I just wanted to be up front and let, her, and let folks know that because that's the, that's, that's the context for everything that we're going to be talking about today. Because if God stopped doing it then, then all we have to lean on is the word of God. And the word of God is truth, but God gives us the word so that we can do what? We can move forward. We can feel propelled to take the Bible as the, as the, the, the manifest word of God and the, and the tool that we use and we can go forward and we can speak out against injustice. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, so we want to begin by reading Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says here, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for, has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. So this is actually Daniel 
essentially speaking on behalf of Nebuchadnezzar. So to kind of go back a little bit and talk a little bit about chapter one and chapter two and chapter three. Um, so the people, of, the people of Israel were actually taken into captivity and in, taking into, in being taken into captivity, there were actually, um, particularly this book speaks to four different individuals who were part of that group who were taken captive. And those, uh, we often hear the term, the three Hebrew boys and Daniel. So the names that were given to them uh, that are actually not their given names, it's actually not their Hebrew names, um, it's their names given to them by, uh, by the Babylonian empire were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if any, most people who grew up in church and uh, heard the story of these three Hebrew boys, um, what we know is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was king uh, at the time, uh, developed a, a golden statue. And what was asked of everyone who was uh, in Babylon at the time was to bow down and worship the statue. But these three boys actually decided, they made a decision because the God they served told them that they weren't to bow down to any other idol they weren't to bow down to any idol. They were only to bow down to God. And so what they, they made a decision in that day that they weren't going to follow the tenets of the king, but instead they were going to, they weren't going to be disrespectful, but instead that they were going to do what God had called them to do. And so they were actually threatened with, um, they were actually threatened with uh, being executed by being thrown into a fiery furnace. So this all took place. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. Um, and when they were thrown in, uh, they actually weren't burned. Actually, the people who threw them in actually died because they were burned. And so when they were uh, thrown in, what someone said um, in telling the story was that when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, Nebuchadnezzar didn't just see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He actually saw a fourth person who was the son of God. So that's already, that's already delivering to us a prophetic word about what, what was to come, like who was to deliver us? Who was to give us salvation? And so when they were released, Nebuchadnezzar, or we thought at the time, decided to make a decision that he was actually going to serve the one and only true living God, which was the God of the Hebrew people, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if anybody knows anything about Daniel, Daniel was also one of these three Hebrew boys. So he actually took about, um, I believe it was a, over a three-year period, they actually learned the language of the Chaldeans, who were the people of that particular region. And so in doing so, Daniel was doing something that was very um, particular to people who have a prophetic voice. Daniel was actually a mouthpiece for God. And one thing that Daniel did that was really interesting was that in learning two different languages, Daniel was then able to do what? He was actually able to negotiate and flip back between the Hebrew language and, um, and uh, the, the language of the Chaldeans. So even if you actually look at the book of Daniel, it was actually written in two different languages. It was written um, in, uh, in Hebrew, and then I believe the second language was Aramaic, if I'm not mistaken. So at the time, Hebrew was obviously the language of the people of Israel, and then uh, Aramaic was actually the uh, language of uh, commerce, discourse, and politics. So that actually presented something interesting. What it did was it suggested that Daniel, as a prophet of God, did what? He was bilingual, right? Um, and so the first point I want to make about people who have a prophetic voice is that actually they're operating in the bilingual. They're speaking the word both of God and they're speaking the word of men simultaneously. Um, so I don't know if folks have ever heard the term, um, but there's a term uh, that's often used in the black community called code switching. And what code switching suggests is that we as black folks actually are often translating and transitioning between two different languages. We're speaking the language of the dominant culture, but we're also speaking a language that was given to us by our ancestors. And so when people got brought over from uh, Africa, uh, the vast majority of people who were brought over in the transatlantic slave trade were from West Africa, right? So when these people were brought over, obviously they didn't speak the language of the lands that they were brought to. So then it was incumbent upon the people who were enslaved and brought here to do what? To learn the language of the place that they went, right? Does that sound familiar? When the children of Israel were captured and taken into captivity, they were then forced to do what? They were forced to learn the language of, they, had, they knew the Hebrew language, but they were forced to learn the language of the Chaldeans. So in that kind of like, uh, in, that, in that negotiation between delivering the word of God to man, and then that translation, right, they were able to then say, okay, 
I'm speaking, I'm speaking the word of God, but I'm speaking it in a way that the people of God can understand. And so in doing that, they then communicated, they were able to then communicate this and what? Nebuchadnezzar then became a believer, although not quite. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about vision and prophetic imagination. So uh, Pastor Mark Batterson, who is the pastor of a church uh, here in the DC metro area called National Community Church, NCC, uh, he delivered this amazing uh, sermon where he primarily talked about uh, the four declarations of the prophetic imagination. So the first one he said was, you are called to be prophet, to be a prophet to, the, to your sphere of influence. So let's go back to Daniel. Actually, you know, it's, it's interesting. I just thought about this. So when you, look at, um, when you look at the three Hebrew boys and how they were asked to bow down to um, uh, an idol, a statue that was built, if you will, um, I would say that there is an interesting parallel to what we're experiencing today, right? What are we talking about as part of this discourse about, around racial justice? the tearing down of statues. And so I think that oftentimes, while statues in essence is to pay homage to someone, if we're leaning on them as idols, then we're doing the very thing that the Babylonian people were doing at this time. I'm not comparing necessarily like America to Babylon, although some people have made that comparison like historically, especially when you look at toward the end of the book of Daniel. But I'm just, I'm just suggesting that we need to be mindful and careful about what we set up to glorify because oftentimes those God, those things are going against the very like essence of what God calls us to, which is equality, which is equity, which is justice. That was something that obviously they weren't doing in Babylon. And I would say that we're, we're kind of repeating the mistakes of the past, if you will, but I digress. So uh, the second thing that uh, Pastor Mark said was uh, to bring the supernatural solutions to seemingly impossible problems. If we look at social justice, social justice today, Oftentimes, what did Dr. King say? He said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it does what? It bends toward justice, right? So what he's, what he's suggesting is that although this seems like something that's incomprehensible, something that we will never see, we will never see uh, rectified in our lifetime, it is, it is possible if we look from a supernatural perspective and come up with supernatural solutions. And I would argue that the supernatural solution that we look to for social injustice is what? the infilling of the Holy Spirit, and then God dictating our path, ordering our steps through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Number three, he says, quit cursing the darkness and light a scented candle with the aroma of Christ. I love this. Uh, we often hear the quote, uh, stop cursing the darkness and light a candle. But I love this metaphor uh, of a scented candle with the aroma of Christ. Um, essentially, like, think about it. Like, when we represent to this world what it is like to be uh, a follower of the Most High God, we are actually going around, and in doing so, people are experiencing us, right? Like, has, if, if anybody's ever heard this, um, like, I remember there was one time before I came to Christ, I was on the city bus, I was a teenager, and uh, there was this guy who was on the bus, and he had on headphones, and he had uh, two drumsticks, and he was just kind of air drumming. And there was just something that was different about this particular guy that I just sensed. Like, I didn't know what it was at the time because I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have, well, first of all, I didn't know Christ fully. Um, and then I also didn't have a language to describe it. But there was just something, like, thinking back on it now, I'm like, oh, this guy, this guy was sanctified. Like, this was a guy who was riding this bus who just knew the peace of God, and he was just, he was just living in that. So I picked up, like, that, 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 that aroma that aroma of Christ, that scented candle, I picked up on that from afar, and we're the same way in being beacons for what Christ called us, called, called us to be, right? Uh, he talks about, you know, us being a city on a hill, like a, 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 um, a city that cannot be hid. You know, you wouldn't put a bushel over a candle because what would happen? It would then snuff out the candle. So we should let our light, what, shine before uh, uh, the people of God so that they may see us, but do what? Not glorify us or the things that we're doing, but glorify him. And then lastly, he talked about how God is raising up a generation of Daniels, of Esthers, of Deborahs, of Nehemiahs. These are ordin seemingly ordinary people. There was something distinct about uh, Daniel. I mean, all of them were unique in who they were, um, but essentially they were just like us. Like they weren't, you know, they weren't divinely born, you know, um, uh, through a virgin birth, for example. Like, right, they were just like us. But in, 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 in God seeing them as ordinary people, he knew that they could do what? He could use them as mouthpieces to do extraordinary things. So uh, he uh, took ordinary people with the prophetic anointing uh, that enabled them to do things 
that they can't actually take credit for. Um, when we look at Daniel in particular, the reason that I really wanted to focus on Daniel is because there was actually something that was a little bit different and peculiar about Daniel. Um, actually, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, used, used to use a term uh, called a talented tenth. And it was actually, that was a term that wasn't coined by him, but he used it in a lot of his writings. And what he suggested was that there was this 10% of black people who were called to be different, who were called to be separated, who were called to be peculiar amongst their community, and they were called out to do greater things. Essentially, Daniel was a part, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of that talented tent, if you will. Um, which is actually like another interesting parallel between the time of God in, in the book of Daniel and what we're experiencing today, right? What we experienced in the early uh, 20th century with W.B. Du Bois. There's, there's definitely, you don't generally hear that about dominant culture, about white folks, for example. But with folks of color, with folks who have been oppressed, you often hear, oh, there's like this certain like group within them that are special, if you will. Um, but we know that through the word of God, God uses the ordinary and makes them extraordinary. So it's not just that Daniel was special. And so therefore, that's why Daniel was used as a prophetic mouthpiece or a voice. But it's, it's in spite of that to a certain extent. And so that's when you look at folks like the Deborahs, the Esthers, the Nehemiahs, and other people with the prophetic voice who were seemingly just ordinary people who were put into extraordinary circumstances. So let's talk a little bit about the province of the prophet, right? Um, so when we talk about the prophet or prophecy, we talk about like, what did it like, why, why are we here? Why are we talking about this? So essentially, uh, there are four questions that we often ask on, on prophecy. So number one, what is prophecy? Number two, who are prophets? Number three, uh, what do prophets do? And then number four, what don't prophets do? So I just want to go through these very quickly, because I think it's important to name what we're talking about. When we talk about prophecy and what it is, we're not talking about necessarily the telling of things that are happening in the future, right? Prophets often do, well, three things, right? They speak to the past, they speak to the present and the future. When we look at prophecy as like a tool, it is often just professing the word of God or professing the name of God. So just by virtue of me reading a Bible, I'm actually taking the word of God and I'm putting it forth to his people, which is a way of, uh, of giving someone a prophetic word. Um, but then there's also the prophecy that actually speaks to the things that we through our own natural minds, right, wouldn't know anything about. So the prophetic is both just the, the simple, I would say like with a lowercase p, and I don't mean this to like reduce one, like subordinate one, but when I say lowercase p prophecy, that's just the declaration of the word of God, right? That can be just reading from the Bible and speaking to somebody a word of encouragement or a word of exhortation or a word of empowerment. Um, and there's also prophecy, the prophecy that sometimes we tend to be a little bit more uncomfortable with because that is like those things that are divinely given to us not just through God's word, but through our direct connection, through, you know, um, through seeking God and being in connection with God, that we then are able to discern things that maybe we weren't, we wouldn't normally be able to. So it was, so something, um, I think it was uh, Pastor Anna was uh, preaching uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she said something that was really interesting, and then I jotted it down and just wanted to mention it. Um, what she suggested was that prophets um, essentially did not just come to condemn, right? Prophets actually came to bring comfort. And so when she said that, it immediately brought me to uh, the scripture, and she actually may have named the scripture, 1 Corinthians 4.13. But the one who prophesies speaks to, to people for their strengthening, their encouragement, and their comfort, right? This goes totally against everything that we always thought about the prophetic word or the prophetic voice. We always think of prophecy as being doom and gloom, like what's going to happen? What is God going to tear down? What is God going to um, what is God going to punish? But it's actually to deliver people to a point where they're then like, oh, what is God going to build up through the people? What is God going to who is God going to raise up? Who is God going to empower? Who is God going to move forward? When we think about prophets like Jeremiah or Isaiah, for example, a lot of it was actually very encouraging, even if it was what? Challenging people for the things that they've done, for maybe not following God's word, for not being righteous or not being just. Real quick, I want to just, uh, so this chart, I don't necessarily want to go through, but it's really interesting. I wanted to point out uh, when, uh, when this person talked about what is uh, prophecy about, they talked about the past. They talked about the present, and then they talked about the future. So I want to point out here, I didn't, when, when, when doing this research, I didn't look up, oh, what does, what does prophecy say about social justice? 
This was actually just the first, um, just the first image that came up through my search. And it says, in the present, a prophet speaks to what? Oppression and suffering. And generally oppression and suffering of people who have been marginalized, people who were taken from their home, like when we talk about the children of Israel, being stolen from their people and brought to a kingdom that they did not know and were forced to be amongst the people, people that they did not, people that they did not call family. And then number two, when we look at prophecy for the future, it's what? It's looking at God's promises, but it's also speaking to peace and justice. Like, I think that's so powerful. Like, when we, the, the, the very oracle, the very word of God spoken to us and, and God's people are actually to, 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 to break bondage, right? To, to free captives, to deliver people, to bring peace and to bring justice. So real quickly, what do prophets do, right? Prophets generally do two things. They are pointing out blind spots, number one. So they're telling us what it is that we're missing, what it is that God has declared that we're actually not following or we're actually not abiding by. For example, when we're called to treat people justly and we're not doing that. So it's pointing out that blind spot. But then number two, Pastor Mark Batterson says that it's actually protecting the blind side. So real quick, if anybody knows anything about American football, uh, there's something called a blind side. Most of you probably saw the movie. Um, there was a book that was way better, but it was way more complicated. And in this, what it said was that there was this one quarterback, uh, Joe Theismann, who played for the Washington football team, if I remember correctly. And um, he, was, uh, he was hit and uh, injured to the point of ending his career by Lawrence Taylor, one of the greatest uh, uh, linebackers of all time. So after that, everyone realized that the left side of the quarterback's vision was, was impaired because, I'm sorry, the right side of the quarterback's vision was impaired because most quarterbacks threw with their right hand. So, yes, it was their left side. So when you throw with your right hand, you turn your body, and that then what? Creates a blind side to your left. So what did most teams do? They got, their, they got one of their best players to be on the left side to protect the blind side of the quarterback. So essentially that's what prophecy is also doing. It's protecting God, people, right? It's protecting our loved ones. It's protecting the very people that we care about. And in this case, it's protecting people who are being marginalized by systemic racism, by systemic sex, uh, sexism, by other forms of oppression. It's protecting them from having their blind side attacked. So really quickly, this is very important. So what don't prophets do? This is very important. I need everyone to listen really closely here. So there are four things that um, just kind of do through research, through reading Cornell West's book, uh, Black Prophetic Fire, through listening to Pastor Mark Batterson, through reading like uh, just a, a lot of different things, what I realized was that it boiled down to four things. Number one, prophets do not virtue signal. And what that means is if we go back to the scripture where, um, where Daniel was talking about, uh, or uh, Daniel was talking about Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is essentially like exalting God in his words. But if you look at Nebuchadnezzar's behaviors, they were doing every, he was doing everything but. And so virtue signaling is essentially saying, oh, look at me. I'm actually, I'm actually trying to be righteous. I'm not, or not trying to be. I'm actually righteous. I'm actually holy. When in essence, you're doing something. The, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing because they're doing two totally different things. And so that's what we see with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Number two, prophets don't virtue shame. And so we don't need to look any further um, for this than uh, when we look at um, when Jesus uh, defends the woman who was caught in adultery. Um, what did the Pharisees at the time want to do? They wanted Jesus to condemn her there on the spot. And actually the punishment at, at that particular time, the punishment was to actually stone her. But what did Jesus say? He said, he who, would, he, who is, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So essentially, they were trying to virtue shame, but Jesus flipped the script on them, and he was like, no, 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 no. You guys are saying that she's not virtuous, and, but in how you're doing it and in the way you're doing it, you're actually the ones who aren't being virtuous. So a prophet doesn't virtue signal, nor do they, do they virtue shame. The third thing a prophet doesn't do is they don't take the moral high ground from the high ground. And what I mean by that is, Oftentimes, what we'll try and do is we'll try and stand at a distance, and this is especially true for people who are of the dominant culture who are privileged around their identities. So we'll just take uh, we'll just take uh, black folks and, uh, and and white folks who aren't engaging in anti-racism work, right? So 
what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll be removed from the oppression that's happening and then they'll point a finger and say, oh, see, that's why that's, you guys shouldn't riot because that's not good. Or, oh, if you, if you all act differently or if you act better, right, it's like those respectability politics. And I think it was during Matt's uh, uh, presentation earlier, we talked a little bit about this, how oftentimes we'll, we'll say, we'll dictate how people behave and we'll, we'll, we say, we'll treat them according to how they behave when we know that that's actually not true at all. It's actually quite the opposite sometimes. When we look at someone like Christian Cooper, for example, who was just, you know, bird watching, right? Um, and and walking, through, uh, walking through the park in New York City, he was doing nothing that we would often say, oh, well, he, you know, he, was, he had a toy gun like we did with like Tamir Rice, for example, or um, the, the young man who was uh, shot in the, the Walmart in Ohio, if I remember correctly, right? Like we oftentimes point to what someone, uh, 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 Castillo, uh, when he was in his car, it was like, oh, well, if he, was, if he didn't have a gun, then maybe he wasn't shot when he was actually a licensed gun carrier, right? So we often say, oh, it's because of what you do, but then when you don't do the things that they tell you not to do, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily remove you from harm because the problem is not your behavior, the problem is the racist attitudes towards you. So that's taking that, more, that's taking that high ground from a, from a high place. Um, the, the verse I gave for that was uh, looking, at, um, uh, looking at Elijah uh, when he came down and he challenged uh, the prophets of Baal. Right. He didn't do it from afar. He didn't say, oh, you guys, you, your gods are your gods are weak. Your gods can't your gods can't be my God. No, he went down amongst them and he challenged them face to face. And when we when we're called to, to, to challenge oppression, when we're called to challenge racism, when we're uh, called to challenge other forms of discrimination. It's very important that we confront it face to face and not try and hide behind some sort of veneer of like, oh, I'm, I'm better. I'm, I'm I'm holier than thou. And then number four abusing the gifting or the platform. So uh, the example that I immediately thought of for this was, um, was the prophet, um, or the, uh, essentially he was a, a, a diviner, right? Um, but it was, a, it was a form of prophecy. So he was a prophet and he was called by a king, King Balak, who was king of the Moabs, right? He was the, the Moabites. He was actually called to curse the children of Israel because the, the children of Israel were seen as so strong. Right. So King Balak was actually asking Balaam to, 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 to curse the children of Israel as opposed to speak a blessing under them. But we know that a prophet is not able to actually curse the people of God. A prophet is called to actually bless the people of God. So that is something that a prophet wouldn't do would be to abuse their gifting or their platform. Another thing that immediately came to mind was um, was uh, in, in the book of Acts, Simon the sorcerer, right? Like, what did he do when he saw the manifestations of the Holy Spirit? He told Peter, he said, well, how much how much do I have to pay in order to have this type of like power? And uh, essentially, Peter rebuked him and uh, said, like, you can't like. This is this is the this is based on the manifestation, the spirit of God. This is not based. This is not something that you can actually monetize. It's not something you can co could commodify. And so you need to repent, or else. And so what I hope in my heart is that Simon turned. Um, but he was actually trying to take a gifting and actually commodify it, um, which is something that prophets don't do. Let's actually, um, we're about 40 minutes in, so let's do this. Let's actually break into discussion groups because I want you all to have a little bit of time uh, to talk to one another and to uh, share. So I have a set of discussion questions that I will, let's see here. Let me just read the questions to you and then I'll try and see if I can share them in the rooms. So number one, what qualities did Daniel possess that made him a willing vessel Number two, who are prophetic voices for justice that we've learned about, and not necessarily here, but like, you know, through, through our, through the, throughout the day or through our own uh, independent study or in school? The third question is, in what ways do we attempt to disqualify ourselves? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later before we wrap up. And then number four, in what ways can we prepare ourselves to be prophetic vessels? So everyone just kind of think on those questions everyone will just be asked to answer one question. So you don't, we're, we don't have time, unfortunately, for you to answer all four questions. So just think about which question speaks to you. So number one, what, uh, what qualities did Daniel possess that made him willing, a willing vessel? Number two, 
who are prophetic voices for justice that we've learned about? Number three, in what ways do we attempt to disqualify ourselves from being prophetic voices? And then number four, in what ways can we prepare ourselves to be prophetic vessels? All right, so let's try breakout groups here.